with James chapter 5. I want you to look to someone and say, are you ready? Now, this was a little tough. This was a little tough. You know how James is. The book of James can go up all around. And um, as I read this, I said, oh, come on. I need you, Lord. I need you to help me to share and articulate on these six scriptures. Amen. So before we begin, we are going to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you, Lord. And I pray that you would help me, God. I pray your anointing to flow upon me, God. Breathe on me this morning, God. I pray that our hearts would be open, Father. Let your word come forth, God, with clarity, God. I pray, God, that our hearts would be open, Father, to hear the voice behind the voice, that you would speak, Father, this morning. And we are careful, God, to give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So as you remember, we, we ended James chapter 4. And we talked about, about incorporating God into your plans. Remember that? We talked about how, how the, the church members said, today or tomorrow we will go to this city and that city, spend a year and carry on business, already making plans and statements for what was about to take place a year ahead. Not even knowing, like, man, I, 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 don't, I can't predict the future. And what James was telling the believers was just, man, stay close to God and make sure as you plan your life that you incorporate God into your plans. And I remember we spoke last week, and we all know what it is when we make plans without God. Can I get an amen? amen. Has anyone here ever made plans, forgot to incorporate God, and it didn't work out so well? Amen. If that's happened to you, let me hear you say amen. amen. Good, I'm in the right place. Here we go to, to chapter 5, verse 1, and the Bible reads, get ready, because as I read this, this is pretty tough. The Bible says, now listen, you rich people, reap and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Let me remind you, this portion of scripture is, out of this whole chapter, James is probably using the harshest language. This is a straight rebuke to those that he's talking to. He says, because... He says, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. That's a heavy statement in itself because gold and silver, it's scientifically impossible for it to corrode or rust. It has no iron in it. That's heavy. He says, your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. <laughs> Ay, ay, ay. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers you, who mowed your fields are crying out against you, the people you burned. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence, meaning materialism has become priority in your life over God. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. James chapter 5, verse 1 through 6. That doesn't feel good, amen. <laughs> he begins the chapter saying, now listen. Other translation says, come now. The way that James begins this chapter, the wording that he uses is only found twice in the Bible, and it's both by James. And when he says, come now, he's trying to get their attention. He's like, listen, I need you to listen up. And the reason James says that is because he's trying to get their attention, right? He's saying, look, this is what I'm saying. I'm about to go into this, right? And I need it to not go over your head. I need you to have an open heart. I need you to catch it. If it's for you, catch it and take it to prayer and ask God to speak to you. James, was, James with his leadership was being super intentional, right? Because he didn't want to give this out. He's seen the problem. He's seen what was taking place. He's seen what was wrong. As a man of God, now I have to address it. But man, I don't want to pray and prepare and speak because it ain't easy. 
You ever confronted someone that is doing wrong? I mean, not in the flesh. We've probably all done it in the flesh. You know, I'm going to give you a piece of my mind or I'm going to tell you or I'm going to let you know how I feel. But if we do it in the spirit, you're just like, ah, if I got to do it the way God wants me to do it, this is a little hard. This is where I got to pray. I got to pray. And sometimes, like, I'm nervous because I don't want to lose it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Let me, let, me, let me tackle this in a godly way. And because I'm going to do it in a godly way, I've been in the place where I've been, like, nervous. Not because I'm afraid of confrontation. It's victory outreach. There's nobody turning down fades in this church. But, <laughs> but I'm saying that, that when you do it in a godly way, it's kind of nerve-wracking because you want to do it in a godly way. And you're like, oh, my God, I'm not used to doing this with God, with the spirit of God taking over this. So it could be a little, it could be a little bit, it could be a little not easy. And when you try to do it in a godly way, what you'll do sometimes without knowing is you'll leave pieces out that you know will bring a little bit. Like you're going to bring it to the, you're bringing it to light. And you're going to leave a part out maybe to avoid that conflict. Because I already know every time I mention this one thing, we go there. Can I get an amen? You guys following me this morning? Right? But what James is doing, he's like, look, come now. Listen. Now listen. I don't want it to go over your head, and I want to communicate clearly to you. I don't want you to leave this moment not understanding what I'm trying to say, what the Lord has imprinted inside me to tell the believers of the church. I don't want you to, I don't want you to leave this conversation not knowing what God placed in my heart to tell you. Amen? That's heavy because I, I've done that before. I've made that mistake. And then my wife will be like, so how'd it go? And I'll be like, oh, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Well, because I did good and I said this and I said that. But when it came to this area, I kind of like, I, I hope that they got it. <laughs> because it's like, because you, know you know what the possibility is of going there. Right? So it's easy to do it in the flesh or the worldly way because we'll say what we want to say. But when you do it in a godly way, it's a little bit harder. Can I get an amen? amen. To all the leaders that work with people, can I get an amen? amen. Right? So you realize it's not so easy when you do it the godly way. So James is just being super clear. That's how he starts off the chapter by saying, listen, right? He's trying to get their attention because he doesn't want it to go over their heads. Because, in fact, there were rich people in the congregation. This is the third time he mentions them in the chapter. There were rich people. People that have accumulated more than what they started with in their Christianity. Amen. Is there anyone here that is blessed today? Amen. That has more than they did when they were in the world. Can I get an amen? amen. I know what I had in the world. A bad attitude. Come on, come on. <laughs> A bunch of bad decisions, amen, <laughs> you know. But he's talking to the people, to the rich people in the congregation. Verse 1, it says, right, now listen, you rich people. Now, I'm just going to explain this. I'm going to break this down to you as best I can because it gets better, right? Now listen, right, he gets their attention. You rich people, those of you that have more than what you started with, right, reap and wail. Because of the misery that is coming on you. Weep. He tells the people to weep. He tells those that are rich, the ones that he's talking to, I need you to weep. Respond with deep grief, deep grief and remorse as if you just experienced a tragedy. I need you to weep. And this is how, you, this is how I want you to weep. I want you to wail. That means not quietly. I want you to howl in anguish. I want it to hurt. Why should I reap and wail? He says, rich people reap and wail as if though you experience a tragedy as though it hurts. Because I want you to understand, because you focus so much on your riches of what you were trying to accumulate, I want you to reap and wail at all the opportunities you lost for the kingdom of God because you put yourself first in what you wanted and your misplaced priorities. All of a sudden, you've gained so much. What, what you're chasing has gained priority over what God, who God is in your life and what he's done in your life. And James's warning, rebuking, if you would, were to those that had placed so much hope in their riches. They put so much hope in their riches, man. And, and what they had to do to get it, 
that he was telling them, you're going to face, you're going to face your own form of destruction. And he's warning them. Verse 2, it says, your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. You know, Luke 16, 13 says, the Lord Jesus Christ stated an important spiritual principle. No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And because of that, James exhorted, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew 6, 19. This is what James is telling the believers. Those, he's addressing the rich people. But it's deeper than that. Your gold and silver, verse 3 says, your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify you, testify against you, and eat your flesh like fire, right? This is a heavy statement because this is a heavy statement by James, as I mentioned earlier when I opened up. Gold and silver don't corrode. They don't have iron in it. It's a, it's a scientific impossibility, right? This statement is powerful because it speaks to the absolute uselessness of gold and silver hoarded by the rich, meaning there's things that only God can be able to do in our lives. And it speaks of the absolute uselessness of gold and silver. Verse 4 says, look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. He's telling the rich, you burn people to get where you are. You've used people. They're crying out against you. The Bible says you reap what you sow. This is James's warning. James, verse 5, you have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned, verse 6, you have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. Man, he's telling those in the congregation, it wasn't for everyone, but there were certain ones that needed to hear this. Look, you think because you have, because I'm going to be honest with you, the more you have, sometimes you can get to a place where I don't need, when everything's going good, I don't need God. I got a promotion. I'm making six figures. I own my own house. I, I own this. I own that. You could feel like I don't really need God. Right? I'll worship God, but I don't need him. It's usually when you have nothing that you can come to the house of God and be like, you know, it's heavy. When, when people, I've seen people first get saved and they don't have anything. You got no wife, you got no kids, you know. You just got saved, right? And you're, a, you're at everything. Anything that has to do with God, I am there, put me down. I'll go to Bible study, I'll go hit the streets, I'll go help here, I'll go help there. I just want to be close to the things of God. Because I thank God for what God has delivered me. God delivered me from trouble. God is helping me. Right? But as you accumulate right, these blessings, come on now. As you accumulate these blessings and different things begin to pull you. right? Different things begin to pull you. Here's a perfect example. You start to get blessed financially. And you're like, you know what? I'm taking a vacation. Vacations are great. Go relax. Get a hold of God. But 20 times a year? That's heavy. Your priority, your, this is heavy. You don't even realize this, but you have a higher priority in your life than God. All right? That's heavy. I want to be around the things of God. I want to be close to the things of God. You get an amen? That was a rough amen. <laughs> you have lived in luxury and self-indulgence. Now, don't get me wrong. I need a vacation too. But I got to keep the right perspective. And trust me, I need a vacation. But I also know that I got to help. What God did for me, I have to do for others. Can I get an Amen. There's plenty of you and I still out there. God can heal the brokenhearted. 
right? But they need your testimony. They need your special touch, right? Because God, you know, it's, it's heavy because as we as, we as a body, we, we serve God, we worship God, we're here at our post, and then when we walk through the doors, and we'll see, and we'll get to know, and we'll hear, and we'll, we'll call you like a specialist. Hey, this one's for you. This one has your name written all over it. Go, you know, and share what you've been through. Tailor made, right? So, you, but you gotta be, you gotta be sensitive to the spirit. Sometimes, let's say, a sister will walk in, you know, and she's young and pretty and single, and then the brothers think that one's me. I'm on it, Pastor. I'll go encourage her. No, not you. Send the sisters, right? Oh, here comes, here comes, here comes a single mother with her kids, believing God. Here, this one's for you. God, share what God delivered you from. Yeah. Or here comes that one marriage that everybody thinks is not going to make it and say, so-and-so, so-and-so. Nobody, nobody thinks they would still be together, but God has come them together, right? <laughs> share. Look it. If God did it for us, he can do it for you. No matter who it is or what it is. There's going to come a time where somebody will come through those doors and they're part of your destiny of why you got saved. God didn't just save you to put on a suit, to look handsome, to look pretty, to put the makeup and do all that stuff. God called us to help people, right? So there's going to come a time in your Christianity where God will bring people specifically for you and your number will be called, right? And then so what do I do? Just share what God did in your life. They're going to sense it as you speak. But you speak. Well, I don't, I don't know the Bible. Watch. As you share, the Holy Spirit will begin to touch them, and they'll know what you're telling them was an absolute move of God. Because the Holy Spirit will be in that conversation. Amen. Amen. And that's what he begins to tell them. Like, you guys got to keep the main thing, the main thing. The powerlessness of riches. Because the landowners, what happened was, or the rich people, is, what happened was is that they got, now, now don't get me wrong, it's not, it's, not wrong, it's not a bad thing to be rich, right? I'm praying for God to bless some of you guys, not all of you guys. <laughs> That's bad, I just played. Erase that from the, from the message. But I really do, man, because you know why? There's plenty of people that, have, that were wealthy in the Bible. Abraham, Lot, Job, Zacchaeus, Matthew, Joseph and his brothers that God had made wealthy, right? This is the problem, though. You can't be tempted by the evil of materialism, the sin of materialism, you know? This is, this is how you know is when you take... Materialism in the Bible is when... You start to put material things before God. It's not about how much money you have. It's about the, you could have, you could be blessed and God could still be, you could have more money than anyone you know, but because God is the focus of your heart, the center of your heart, and you have your priorities straight, you're a blessed, you're blessed to be a blessing. But it's when, it's when the things that you've accumulated become, they take more priority in your life than God does, that's when it becomes a problem. When you take gold and you turn it into God. When you take gold and you turn it into God. Now I'm doing my best to share these six scriptures that are pretty heavy. So I want you to look to someone. This is your first time here. And I want you to look to someone that maybe you doesn't live for me and says, don't worry, it'll get better next week. But I got to share the word of God. Amen. When you take gold and turn it into God. It's taking this attitude in which you expect gold to do what God is supposed to do. It's an attitude of what you, ex what you expect the gold in your life to do what God is supposed to do. Meaning, the finances or the riches or the wealth that I have is going to take care of this and this. When reality is, these are things that God is supposed to take care of. But you're using your finances to try to bring you a false peace. Or you're using your finances to try to buy love. Right? Come on, us as men, whenever we make our wives mad, what do we do? We buy them something. And we, and we realize after a while, they're just like, yeah, you keep buying me stuff, but you're the same. 
I'll take it though. Thank you. Thank you. I'm blessed. But that same thing keeps popping up. There you go again. There you go. I don't want to bash the men, so we'll, we'll turn it around. You understand, you understand where I'm going? Right? You understand where I'm going with this? You can't expect gold to do what God is supposed to do. We have to keep our faith genuine. We have to keep our faith genuine and in God. Right? It's heavy, man, because this is, this is, this is how you know. It's like, this is how you know when, it gets, when it's getting to a point where, okay, you need to keep the right perspective. Okay? When you have to choose between gold and God. You will have moments where you have to choose between the two. Right? Because, look, at when you, when, you, when, you, when you make gold take the place of God, it's like, oh, no, no, I can't, I can't, I can't, I got to work. Or I can't, I got to do this, I got to do that. And it's like, okay, it's a pretty big picture. You're depending on yourself and on what you can do with your hands, and you're taking your faith out of God's hands. Put your faith in God. You don't, sometimes we don't, even, we don't even give God an opportunity to come through. I've been there. Well, I just start doing, and it's like, well, I can't. Well, you know, it's like, bro, that thing's like a month away. You're already saying no? You didn't even try. I can't, I can't do it. I'm working. I said, that's a month away. You haven't even prayed about it? You haven't even asked God to make a way. You haven't even put your faith in God and says, God, you're going to work it out for me. You, you don't even allow God an opportunity to show up, to come up to you. And when you hear the rest of our testimonies, when you hear, when you hear like how I did when I remember when I, when I, because I worked a full-time job before I put on this suit, right? Matter of fact, I still work a full-time job, amen. I forgot. But I'm so blessed that I forget, Right? And it's because I've had moments, I've had moments where I'll stand and I'll be like, no can do. I'm sorry, I can't do that. You know, what? And, and I've seen that maybe other people probably would have got fired. But because I put my faith in, I said, God, you, you open this door and if you close it, it's because you got something better. But I'm not going to let go. I'm not going to let go of the principles and values that, I've, that God instilled in me. And Sunday is the Lord's day. That's the decision I made. Sunday is the Lord's Day, and nobody else can have it. I'm not sharing it with the world. If you're, see, but at the beginning of my salvation, I probably wasn't so, I had to watch God uh, do it for me, and then my faith grew. Oh, my God, God did that. And then I watched God do it again, and my faith grew more. You're not going to start off with a mountain of faith, but you got to start with somewhere. Even with the, with, with the size of a mustard seed, you begin don't, let's keep our faith genuine, let's keep it true, and let's never put our faith more in gold than into God. And that's what James is telling, what he was telling the rich there. He says, man, your perspective's all messed up to the point where you're using people, you're stepping on people, you're, you're, now you're doing it. Now you're not, you're not just making ends meet no more. It's changed. It's changed. Now you're, now you're doing it for luxury and self-indulgence. Man, and you're doing it at the expense of people that did no wrong to you. you know, let's have you. In 1 Corinthians 5.11, Paul talks about the sin of materialism. And he compares it to the sin of a drunken man, the sin of a murderer, the sin of homosexuality. He, Paul, compares the sin of materialism the same as the other. 1 Timothy 6, 17, and I'm going to end with this because when they're rough, I try to go fast. I don't want to beat you for 40 minutes with this, but I can't skip it neither. The Bible's the Bible, you know. We have meat and beautiful side dishes, but then we have vegetables. And I got to eat my vegetables. I got to eat them because they're good for me. I came home the other day and my house smelled like vegetables. <laughs> Ellie was cooking cauliflower and broccoli. I know that smell. As soon as I walked in, my kids were like, what's that smell? I knew exactly what it was. Vegetables. I got to eat it. I got to take it. I got to take it because it's good for me. And this is what James and the Holy Spirit will move. You know, let's always keep our perspective. 
Let's always keep our perspective, our eyes on God, because the people had drifted. And they didn't even realize it. And he was, he was rebuking them pretty hard. He said, you need to repent, man. And you need to do it, you need to do it earnestly from your heart. You need to weep. And you know how you're going to live? You need to wail, man, for the people you've burned and the people that you've mistreated because you let, you let money become your God. It's pretty much what he's saying here in verse 6. Is, and you don't care how you got it. You got so far, you didn't even care how you got it. First Tim 6, 6, 17, verse 18 says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Meaning, God will still provide for us richly for us to be blessed. God wants us to be a blessed people, especially us. Especially us, because it blows people away. We come from rough backgrounds. So when people begin to see us blessed, I'm talking about you guys, we come from broken homes. Come on, come on. We come from addiction. We come from vices. We've come from lifestyles. We've come from generational curses, meaning most of us, our parents didn't serve the Lord and break those chains. A lot of us are first or second generation Christians trying to, but we are doing it. And I really believe God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God will begin to bless your lives just to show off. People say, oh my God, how did you do that? How do you have your own business? You used to do credit card fraud. How do you have this? How do you have that? You used to sell me your EBT. How do you have this or that? How do you have this or that? You have a record with the state that's longer and worse than your credit record. So I believe in all my heart. See, I know the Bible's talking about, James is talking to the, to the church, right? And they had a lot of people that had acquired finances and thought they were better than the ones that didn't have anything. There was a big gap between them. So he's dealing with them. But I look at our church. I'm going to teach the Bible so you know what it says. But right here, in this church, I know you guys have, you, you guys have giving hearts. You know, you guys have giving hearts, man. Every time we do something, you guys are there and you're putting, I mean, everything. Yesterday we had a, 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 a ranger's picnic. Beautiful, the way everybody just comes together. Because you know why? It's bigger than us. It's bigger than us, right? And we see the kids and what they're doing, and they're having a great time. I'm, I'm blessed at stuff like that. That's, that's what the church does. It's what the house of God does. It brings us together, right? And we just keep that giving heart. We keep the right perspective, right? Never letting, don't let, don't let the enemy come in. Don't, don't start thinking like, let God be God. Give him an opportunity. Maybe you've never given him opportunity. Give him the opportunity, right? And don't do it because, oh, pastor said, open up the Bible. The Bible says, Make a stand and say, you know what, I'm not, instead of depending, like, you know what, I had to learn that. I said, you know what, I, start, I had to take myself out of the, of, of the thing, and I says, I remember one time somebody says, hey, how can I help you? And I was like, you can't. And they were tripping out on me, and it was a boss. And I go, honestly, I'm asking the wrong person, because I needed something to take place. And I realized this is just a person. I was asking the wrong person. And he kind of took it like a little bit. I go, I'm asking the wrong person. He was like, I'm your boss, bro. But I said, it's cool, man. I, I, no sweat it. But he knew that I needed something. But it was before I went to go ask, the Lord quickened me and said, take it to prayer. Why are you asking him? Why don't you ask me? Why are you asking him? Why don't you ask me? This guy's not even safe. Why don't you ask me? So I took it to my prayer closet, and I began to ask God. And I watched him come through. I'm talking about, I, I, I asked God. I remember I was working construction. I said, God, I'm tired of working construction because it's, it's, Long drives, in traffic, my body's tired. I said, man, I want a job where I can work in an office with air conditioning and I can sit down. I did. I asked him that, right? I asked him that. And what happened six months later? I got blessed. And then I get to his job and they're telling everybody, we got to work this day, that day, this day, this day. I said, Lord, I said, I can't make it this day and I can't make it that day, you know? Well, why not? Well, because I... I have a commitment to the things of God that I've had before I even met you. I've been doing this for a little while. 
and I have a commitment to the things of God, Amen. you know, Bef- since before, our, before we even knew each other. So I'm not going to change my, my beliefs and the principles that I have for you that I just met, but God's using you. <laughs> Keep letting him use you. No, I didn't tell that. <laughs> but I've always kept the right perspective. This was James was telling the believers, look, it's good to have money. Just don't let it be your God. Don't let it be. But he, but he, I said it in a nice way. He said it in a rough way. Right? He, he, said, he, com, he compared them to murderers. But that's how far they had drifted from God. And I don't believe that here this morning. You know, I, I believe here we're, going, we're growing together. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand. I wasn't too bad. I was wondering. I said, gosh, sometimes the Lord will do this to me. He'll put like a portion of scripture and I'll be like, gosh, why can't I share something like, I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you, but I can't leave it out. Amen. I got to try my best to articulate as we're going through the book of James. James was dealing with people that had maybe lost their perspective and it showed in their actions you know he said man stay focused stay focused don't let god become don't be let don't let gold become your god right and i don't ever want to do that i want to always put my faith i want my faith to be genuine and this is what's going to happen if you want your faith to be genuine guess what faith is not faith until it is tested so you could declare faith right but before it becomes actual faith because anybody could you, you know that you know, nothing is what it is. Love is not love until it's tested. You know, you tell me you love me, but our first argument, are you going to bounce? You know, right? Faith is not faith. Loyalty is not loyalty, right? Commitment is not commitment until it's been tested. Then through the fire, it'll show what it really is, right? And because we want to put our true faith in God, and not make the mis- mistake because James paints a picture for us today to not put our faith in riches and in wealth said throughout the Bible more than once it will we will be tested and we have to when the testing comes we have to hold on to the word of God and allow God an opportunity allow him an opportunity to prove himself faithful because God's faithful God is faithful even when we're not faithful God is faithful amen so with that if this message has spoke to you in any way we're going to open up these altars and we're going to pray amen here I am to worship here I am to